Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sam Drew with the National Dropout Prevention Center. I'm here once again with my co-host and colleague, Marty Duckenfield, also with the center. And we welcome all of you to this monthly radio webcast brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center at Clemson University and in partnership with Clemson Radio Productions and the general support of Penn Foster. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are happy once again to be spending the next hour with you on a topic of some really great importance, adolescent literacy. We welcome back those of you who participated in previous broadcasts, but we especially want to welcome our new listeners to the program. We have an outstanding program planned for you today, so we're ready to get started. And first of all, as usual, I'd like to remind our listeners of the materials that are provided for you on the website for today's program. First of all, and have this out ready, is the slide presentation. This is, in fact, a PowerPoint, which will support today's discussion. So have that open and ready. We also have a large number of other resources on this web page, and I really want to point you to uh, that PDF of Time to Act, I mean, hot off the press. You know, Sam, it even has a date of 2010 mm. on I it. I saw that. Mark. Yeah, so this recent Carnegie report on advancing adolescent literacy is right on the money for us this month, and I think you will find it valuable. So save that for follow-up. There are several uh, resources our presenters have provided, uh, which we uh, ex- re- think you'll find useful after the program for follow-up, and those are PDFs listed there below. Uh, In addition, our three presenters, as we will discuss later, have done a recent publication with us on adolescent literacy, so there's a link to that. Uh, And I want to point out to those who are National Dropout Prevention Network members, you will be getting a copy of that next week as we send this out to our members. Others can link to it and order it online. We have also some great websites. Uh, Those are really good to uh, follow up with. And then finally, you get to see one of our uh, guests, uh, Pat O'Connor, who discusses this issue of literacy in a video clip. So I think we can fairly say there's an incredible amount of information here for our listeners to turn to when the program is over. It is, uh, it's a very important and vital topic that we are covering um, today, Marty, not only for dropout prevention, but um, this area of adolescent um, Literacy uh, relates to so many other issues and problems that we find in communities, including um, crime and violence. So I just want to reiterate what you've already said, and uh, that Carnegie report is an extremely good report, and recommend that after the program um, you read that. And I I think a lot of what is said today um, will make sense through um, through that report or make more sense. We're only going to be able to scratch the surface oh, today. Oh, boy, yes, issue. that's for sure. Well, as always, we invite all of you listeners to be an active part of the program today. Uh, as you know, this is a live radio webcast. It's a call-in show, and we have two ways you can connect to us. And one uh, is by telephone. It's a toll-free number. I'll give it to you now, and we'll try to repeat it several times during the broadcast. It's 888 539 8859, and if you're calling outside the U.S., the number is 864-656-4549. You can begin calling now or any time during the program, and we'll put you on hold, uh, but we will try to get to as many of the questions as we can during the broadcast. We also accept email questions sent to our email address, which is ndpc at clemson.edu. And if you put the word solutions in the subject line, we will know immediately that you're writing about our program. So we try to get as many of those questions as well. Thank you, Marty. We're looking forward to your calls. Um, we want you to call in and ask a question or just make a comment and interact with um, our guest today. We, we are very fortunate today to have assembled all of the authors of that recent publication that um, Marty just referenced called Improving Reading for Academic Success, Strategies for Enhancing Adolescent Literacy, and that's available through the National Dropout Prevention Center. Let me take just a few minutes to um, do a brief introduction. Uh, From Kent State University, no stranger to the National Dropout Prevention Center, we welcome uh, Dr. Pat O'Connor and Dr. Bill Bentz. Uh, they'll be joining us from the NPR studios, I think WKSU um, up there. And then by telephone from Lexington, Kentucky, uh, we have with us Renee Murray, who um, 
who will be contributing a little later today. And um, Renee is a school improvement consultant specializing in adolescent literacy for the Southern Regional Education Board. Um, Pat is on the graduate faculty at Kent State and coordinates teacher education programs in uh, career technology education. And Bill is on the faculty of the Department of Teaching Leadership and Curriculum Studies at uh, Kent State. And welcome to all of you to the program today. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. It's nice to be here with with you. We've had um, many programs um, now over the past um, two years dealing with specific strategies for dropout prevention. They're all archived on our website. They're all important strategies. But I don't think we've had uh, any more important um, topic than the topic we are um, addressing today, that of adolescent literacy. And we certainly have the panel of experts here with us who understand this issue and who understand the solutions. What I think you, the listener, will realize as we move through the discussion today is that um, this is a systemic problem and it really requires um, systemic solutions. And I hope that you'll hear convincing arguments for the involvement of content teachers in this process. This Carnegie report that we referenced speaks about uh, each content area having its own set of literacy skills that all of our students are required to master really before they can move from this concept of learning to read to reading to learn, very different concepts. And those that are failing to master um, these more complex tasks are likely to become the unskilled workers of the future and and also um, linked to many other problems, as I said, and issues uh, that these kids confront and that our communities um, confront. So um, call us with your questions as we move through the broadcast today. And let me give you once again that number before we start, toll free. It is 888-539-8859. And if you're calling from outside of the United States, it's 864-656-4549. So, Pat, maybe we can begin with you, and let's um, let's take a look at the PowerPoint that you've prepared now and, and uh, give our listeners an overview of what you'll be sharing with us today. Thank you, Sam. I'll be happy uh, to do that. Uh, just as a little uh, preamble, I'll be sharing some information, and Dr. Vince also will be, and we'll be including uh, Renee uh, at different sections along the way. Uh, for our listeners that are looking at the PowerPoint, um, let me begin by sharing with you what our presentation is going to focus on today. Uh, this is a abstract, in a way, of the entire monograph that we wrote, dealing with a subject that uh, we're very interested in trying to advance, and that is how can the content area teacher support his or her students in their own reading abilities. To that end, our presentation today is going to focus on information related to the current status of reading, the important role of the content teacher. We'll also share some information about a prescription for improvement, including roles that parents, students, teachers, and schools can uh, incorporate to support their students' uh, improved reading skills. We also have assembled some resources uh, that you uh, can use. Uh, Marty alluded to some of those. If you have an opportunity to look on the website, you'll see all of those listed there, and it's our hope that you'll refer back to those from time to time. Uh, We will also be uh, referring to some of those uh, during our presentation. So if we're all ready, I'd like to begin by going to the uh, next slide (coughs) and sharing just a little bit of information about the current status of reading uh, with a particular quote that I think sums up the uh, goal quite well. As you can see there, the stronger a person's literacy skills, the more likely adults are to hold a full-time job, to vote in national elections, participate in community organizations, more likely to volunteer, and even help their children with their homework. Clearly, that indicates to us that literacy does make a difference for all of us. And that's really the essence of what we're trying to accomplish uh, with our work here is that uh, it does make a difference and we all have a role. Our next slide, for example, gives a little overview of the current status of reading. And we're finding, for example, that most students fall into one 
of three levels when it comes to their reading ability. About 30% of students read on level, that is, they are at the reading level where they should be. Um, about 50 to 60% of our students are in an improvement mode, and about 10 to 20 requires some kind of intervention, and intervention could mean some sort of pull-out intervention, actually, where the child is really not in the classroom with the other children, but rather has to be removed for more involved intervention. You know, Pat, but I that, thought this was a particularly important slide um, that I would like to pause on, and we talked about this earlier this afternoon while we were preparing for the program today, that this middle group is a majority of our students, and it indicates to me here and from our discussions and working on the book that this is a group that is not doing as well as they can in school because of the fact that they aren't prepared to read and understand what's going on. So I just wanted to make the point that we're talking about most of our students. Exactly, Marty. And I think if we also take the academic improvement group and add the intervention group together, (laughs) we could be looking at anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of students need some kind of assistance. Right. In their reading ability, which is a pretty staggering number. And, of course, you look at the number of students who are in school and do the math, and you're talking about millions of uh, students who need assistance. Our next slide, for example, will also uh, point out, as, as I like to think, that we are really at a crisis stage. And uh, I think this discussion and some of these uh, statistics point that out to us. And I would tell you that this is just a few of them. There's a lot more information available, but note that first one there that of fifth grade students and 12th grade students, only three and five of them, respectively, read at an advanced level. Um, And some 75% of struggling third grade readers still struggle in the ninth grade. I think that's an interesting one because it points out that really only one of four students, quote, gets converted, if you will, to becoming an active reader, and you sort of wonder what's happening along the line there, and that's one of the points that really lifts up the importance of the content area teacher because this is where the content area teacher is working with the children because, as Sam mentioned, after grade three, it's no longer about learning to read. It's really more about (coughs) reading to learn. And again, doing the math there, we have about eight million children uh, who read below their grade level. A couple of more items to uh, consider related to this crisis stage and flip to the next slide. About 70% of students entering high school read too poorly to absorb the information that's going to be presented to them. And the next one really hits the nail on the head for me, that it takes a year and a half to remediate. For each year, a student is behind in reading level. And the example that we give there, for students entering ninth grade with a sixth grade reading level, it may very well take their entire high school experience just to get caught up. So those are some pretty uh, staggering kinds of uh, data, and as the next slide points out to and, us, and there's Pat, a whole host. Let, Excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but let me go back to that slide also because, um, boy, that slide hit me like a a brick. <laughs> it was it was kind of a stop dead in my tracks slide, and said so, to clarify for people, are, are we talking here about um, traditional remedial efforts? Uh, in other words, what what will have to happen? Um, to, to speed that up, or can it be speed sped up? Because um, you know, given that statistic, um, not only will it take four and a half years or more than their high school career to catch up, but they're getting further and further behind in everything else. Uh, it, it seems an insurmountable task. I hope that what you have for us today is going <laughs> to <laughs> is going to make that hurdle. Yes, this program is about solutions. You've got it's us really scared definitely. now. <laughs> Well, I think it just points out the severity of this and how important it is yeah. that we are indeed at a crisis type of a situation with this, and sure. we've got to be looking at how we're going to address this. And I think there's a variety of goals that we should be looking at, one of which is to ensure that the children arriving at the ninth grade, more and more of them Absolutely. have the ability to do what they need to do, which says something about middle school and, and farther down as well, and mm-hmm. says about what's happening at, at home before children even get to school. So yeah. it's a... It's a very big task, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And as we see from the social and economic ills associated with this, uh, I think a lot of what happens here when a youngster struggles with reading is limiting their options and it's limiting their choices uh, in a school environment. And as that happens, 
a variety of other difficulties start to present themselves for children. Uh, oftentimes, this is the beginning of the dropout path, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and you all are certainly you know about the most sure. knowledgeable folks on that. Uh, but one I find even interesting is that people with low literacy levels have four times higher health care costs, and that's about the only mm-hmm. number or thing I've seen lately that could help us to reduce health care costs is increase <laughs> literacy rates and mm-hmm. will help with health care costs. So that's uh, another one to consider. It's all connected. It is indeed. But uh, as I say in the next slide, the three main problem areas, uh, and there's a lot of data on this. Uh, We know a tremendous amount about this as it relates to crime, to dropouts, and employability. And reading is, uh, as I like to say, is kind of lurking in there all along. And our next slide is when we talk about our prescription for improvement. Uh, I see this, and I think a lot of us do, that reading is really the problem, but it's also the solution. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many roles for all of us to play in this process of dealing with this very serious situation. Uh, And there's roles for teachers, schools, students, and parents. And uh, our focus at this point in the monograph and the work that Bill and and Renee have uh, brought to our publication uh, deals with the important role of uh, teachers, uh, particularly the content teachers. Mm. One of the things, um, as I was... um, preparing and looking um, through the PowerPoint and um, had the advantage of having looked ahead, um, is that you're, you're going to cover in, in a lot of detail, I think, the role of these particular groups and um, and even particulars within that role, things that they need to know and understand. But as an overall strategy, what, what really needs to happen at the school level, at the community level, um, with parents, you know, to, to get this process underway. In other words, to convince people that, that they really need to pay attention to this and that there is a role for them. We, we've defined the roles, and I think you're going to do a great job of doing that. But, you know, one thing that came to mind is in in places where this has been effective, has there, has there been um, a strong leadership focus at the school level, um, any particular um, parent strategies to get them more involved and, and uh, to assume the, the role that you're going to cover? Well, I think uh, some of what we're going to be addressing, Sam, will touch on some of that. Uh, in general, I think one approach or one way of thinking about this is it's a multifaceted problem, yeah. and therefore it requires a multifaceted solution. Um, sometimes the solutions that we advance attack maybe just a portion of the problem. Mm-hmm. I think more and more people are coming to the awareness that this is multifaceted, that parents have to do something. So do students. Teachers do as well. School climate. Uh, our communities have to be supportive kinds of places that uh, value education and learning. So it is a very uh, multifaceted type of a situation. And Yeah, and I guess that w- that's what was coming to mind with me. It almost yeah. needs to be a community-wide emphasis and approach. or uh, We can attack various parts of the problem or we can, um, you know, we, 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 there's a lot we can do with uh, teachers and their role. Um, it, it almost takes a community-wide effort really to, to involve um, parents and even others in the community in this kind of an effort. And I think that the, uh, some of the statistics that we share point to that, that there are ways to address this and there, it, it gives us a, a bit of a roadmap as to what sorts of strategies we can employ that mm-hmm. are going to make a difference because we, we know, again, we know a great deal about this. And I would also add that there's a lot of people who are very dedicated to resolving these types of problems, yeah, people absolutely. who have uh, outstanding leadership at, at all levels, state government, uh, education, universities, communities, uh, that we know a lot about it, and there's a lot of resources being committed to it. So we, we've got ourselves positioned, I think, Sam, mm-hmm. to really mm-hmm. uh, make, some, make a difference with this. Sure. Okay, well, let's talk about the role of the content area teacher. Well, thanks, Sam. Um, and again, um, uh, it's glad to be with everybody this afternoon. Um, I'm referring for the listeners to uh, slide number 10. And uh, I guess I'll first start off with, um, by content area teacher, we're talking about uh, the teachers who teach specific content areas like math, social studies, science arts and humanities. And this slide is close to my own heart because, quite frankly, I was a English language arts teacher uh, for 10 years. 
And uh, what got me interested in reading was I had an awful lot of uh, middle school and high school students who could read, but they couldn't comprehend. And they left my class, and of course they'd go to the science class, and they were not much better off comprehending in that class than they were in mine. And yet, many teachers at the school sort of looked at me and the other English language arts teachers to have some sense of, well, why can't you fix the problem? Well, the problem wasn't just an English language arts one. It's, it was a problem we all shared. And <clears throat> I guess the, one of the things I've learned from all that experience is sort of looking at reading um, differently. And one of the things that we talk about in the monograph is we try and make a point that reading is actually a tool for learning. Um, we don't look at it in terms of just uh, teaching reading and math, if I were a mathematics teacher. Or if I were a science teacher, my role would be teaching reading and science. Because many content area teachers aren't prepared to literally teach reading. So what we try and do in the monograph is sort of recast the question. And it's how can we use reading as a tool to teach fill in the blank, math, science, social studies. Because if there's one thing that we all do as content area teachers, we use reading in our classrooms. So how do we use that powerful tool to help students learn our content areas? We know an awful lot about that, and we talk about it in the monograph. But teacher knowledge of how you can use reading as a tool to teach content area, your content area, is really critical. One way to do that is set up a literacy-focused classroom. And the thing that I've been uh, somewhat surprised at over the years is students actually read more than what we think. Um, they read and write. They text. Uh, a lot of students that I've been working with read graphic novels and lots of materials that aren't necessarily uh, school-based or traditional types of reading materials, but they, they read nonetheless. Um, one of the things that we can do to build a literacy-focused classroom is what we've known for many, many, many years is that readers often develop when they are immersed in rich language environments. And by rich language, they get a chance to talk about what they read in discussion circles, literature circles, things of that sort. And they talk more when they read high-quality literature. Fortunately, we've got many different types and genres of reading materials out there uh, for kids to read. I've been working recently with um, people from the National Science Teachers Association and the National Council of the Teachers of Mathematics and National Council of Social Studies. And one of the things I've learned from those organizations is that they all advocate the use of high-quality literature to teach their content area material. And that, of course, has been the entry for me to collaborate with uh, people from different disciplines. But the goal is simple. And I'm phrasing it these days is how do we help students become literate in math, literate in science, literate in social studies, but the whole idea that reading is a tool for learning. Now, fortunately, we have lots of ways to do that, and Renee uh, is soon going to uh, talk to us about uh, the big six strategies. Fortunately, we've got lots of strategies to help uh, kids learn how to use literacy to learn across the content areas. I guess at this point, um, we feel strongly that comprehension can and should be explicitly taught and demonstrated to students K through 12. There's lots of strategies for us to do that with. Uh, we've identified many of them in the big six. Oh, I'm sorry, in the monograph. And um, I sort of want to let that be a transition to Renee to talk more fully about six that we, um, we particularly uh, advocate. Thanks, Bill. In our work at the Southern Regional Education Board, we've looked closely at state standards as well as 
transition standards, those things that are important for students to be successful, not only on state assessments, but as they continue in school and, and be successful in hopefully well-paying careers. And when we look at those pages after pages of possible skills, we can boil it down to these are the six on your next slide that are the absolutely critical skills that all students need to master. As Bill said, they are important in every content area. These are not an English class set of standards. They're important for students to be successful and for all of us as adults. And I briefly want to talk about each one of them. Um, I don't think there's going to be any surprise to you as, as you look at these, but these are the kinds of things that show up everywhere. The first improves both reading and writing and is probably the number one most critical skill as you read any information with the research about literacy, and that is to be able to take a piece of text, anything that we read, anything that we see, anything that we experience, and then capturing the main ideas, the gist of what it's about. The one that goes very closely with that is paraphrasing, and far too often we don't teach students to paraphrase in school, and that is taking somebody else's words, taking somebody else's ideas, and put them into different words. Mm. One of the examples of this that I use a lot because it's a perfect study in audience and in purpose is when you experience something, you tell that story differently for different people. If, for example, I were to tell you that in Kentucky today, it's pouring down rain, then that's a pretty simple statement. But if I were to make that same statement to my granddaughter, who is expecting to go on a picnic this afternoon, I couldn't just say to her, it's pouring down rain. We would have to phrase that in a different way because of her age and because of the experience that we are expecting to have. So paraphrasing cuts out that problem with plagiarism for most students, but it's also a skill that we have to be able to use in the business world especially. We only have about 8% of our students who are good categorizers, and those are typically the young people who end up in math and science. But any type of a job, any type of a profession requires us to be able to put things into categories, to be able to figure out what things are alike and what things are different. It's what we have to have to solve non-routine problems, which is what happens every time you call a helpline, um, whether it's having trouble making reservations online or whether it's I can't get my TV to do what I need it to do, we have to categorize those problems. Those 80 up to 80% of our students who are struggling, as we referred to earlier, are those students who typically can't read between the lines. They can typically decode the text, read at a very simple level, but they don't understand what an author really means. They don't understand the sarcasm that may be in a passage. They don't understand the point that an author is trying to make in the newspaper when it comes to an opinion column. So it's reading between the lines makes us a more careful consumer of what we read. Very young children begin predicting, uh, but we often forget the part that good predictions are really inferences. It's forward thinking based on backward knowledge and being able to help students justify, not just I think I'm going to make a million dollars or I think I'm going to be an NBA star, but based on my current knowledge and based on what I can learn, is that a valid prediction? And then finally, the last of the six has to do with vocabulary. Not only do we need to be teaching our students how to decode parts of words to look at those pieces of vocabulary, but every field has a very technical language. When I use the word drill, most of you immediately think of some context. But I guarantee you that the football coach has a different context than does the oil refinery, than does the dentist. And so it's understanding that vocabulary and being able to use it 
shows that I can operate within a real world. One of the resources that you have on the website is a link from each of these six to some strategies that can be used to talk the to excuse me to teach these six skills. Um, many of those are in an SREB publication called Literacy Across the Curriculum. We make reference to some of those in our crisis report that came out a few months ago called A Critical Mission, uh, Making Adolescent Reading an Immediate Priority in SREB States. So those publications are also available on our website and help you see what are some of the things you can actually do with these critical skills for all students? Yes, and I, I do want to point out that we do have your website uh, listed down there, Renee, so yes. people can follow up with that. Um, these these points are really interesting for me to hear because I was, I'm not bragging, but I was a good reader when I was young, <laughs> but I went to high school like we all do, and I hit chemistry. <laughs> and, oh, my, I didn't know what that book was telling me. And if I had a teacher who knew these big six, I think my reading skills were fine, but I didn't understand it with, without a lot of um, effort. And in some cases, maybe I didn't understand it at all. It took a while. So, You're absolutely right. You weren't right, literate right. in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> One of the points that I like to make about this, and, and you have just made it so well with a personal example, is that for many of our students, if they're taking five or six or seven classes a day, it's like going into five or six or seven foreign languages mm -hmm. right. because they don't understand that textbook material mm -hmm. if we can't help them conquer this set of skills as well. Yeah, this is this is great information, and I think any uh, content area teachers there look at it through the lens of their content area can see how they can relate to all of these. I think that would work for me. So um, I'm going to give uh, the toll-free number again just in case we have some people who came in late and missed it. Uh, it's 888-539-8859. Call us any time, and we would love to have your questions. We also have an email, ndpc at clemson.edu, should you prefer to send your questions by email. So um, are we ready to move to the next slide, Bill? I think oh. that's yours. Yes, thank you. I'm already, I, this is um, referring to slide number 12. And in the monograph, we identify 10 or so uh, points uh, that we uh, feel all teachers should know about reading. This slide um, identifies five of them. And with the first one, let me preface it by saying that I'm, I'm very fortunate um, to work with many teachers uh, around the country, and one of the things they often say to me is, many of my students can't read. What can I do about it? And these are middle school and high school teachers. When I talk with them more, what virtually comes out every time is, it's not that they can't read, it's that they can't comprehend. And their question should be, many of my students can't comprehend, what can I do? And that's important because of bullet number one, reading and comprehension are virtually the same thing. In other words, if somebody reads a text and doesn't comprehend, have they read? And our position is no. What we want to do is every time we read, we have the opportunity to learn something, and that's what we often call comprehension. So they're, for us, they're virtually the same thing. The second one is there's a popular belief that many children have to learn to read before they can read to learn. And our position is that almost implies that meaning has to wait, mm. that um, um, a no, uh, some understanding of letters and sounds and words have to occur before you can actually learn something. And, you know, another way to think about that is <clears throat> reading to learn and learn to read just happen simultaneously. And that every time we read something, we have an opportunity to get better at it. And the same sort of analogy that every time, and I don't play the piano, but every time somebody plays the piano, there's the opportunity to get better at it. 
And the third point is um, comprehension increases as students learn to understand the big ideas from what they read. Uh, I've worked with uh, many students who, when they read, w they pay attention to little ideas, ideas that are not that important. So what we focus students' attention on really tells them what reading is. So we tend to want to focus their attention on what are the big ideas in this text. And then sometimes when they look at me and ask me for some clarification, I often tell them, well, ideas that have some enduring value, they're worth thinking about. Ideas that lead to even bigger ideas when we get a chance to talk about it and maybe do some research on it. Uh, the fourth bullet is the more students know about a topic, the easier it is to drive meaning. That's really a question of background knowledge and how important background knowledge is. Sometimes we think without background knowledge, reading is almost impossible, and oftentimes it's, it's very difficult. But another way of looking at it is reading itself builds up background knowledge. And then the last bullet is <clears throat> the more difficult a, a text, the more social and interactive the reading experience needs to be. And I think of my own reading experiences when I had to read about plate tectonics and continental shifts. And Marty just alluded to chemistry. <laughs> And I have very little background knowledge in it. And what I've learned over the years is the less I know about something, the more help I need, both in terms of reading with others so that we together can pool our knowledge um, and work our way through difficult texts. Um, the harder thing is when you don't know much about a topic uh, and you're reading a solitary and individual, it's probably one of the weakest positions a person can put themselves in. So we like sharing those five points uh, with teachers, hoping there would be some value to them. Well, I think they are excellent points. And um, we've had a question come in here, and it's um, probably because two of you are in teacher education, and it's the question about what kind of preparation are pre-service teachers getting who are <clears throat> going to be teaching in the content areas as far as incorporating uh, reading into, you know, as we're discussing here today? Is this something well, that is required by NCAID and others, I think this person means, or, or what? Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, at least here at Kent State and the other universities that I've been uh, fortunate to uh, be a member of, uh, in their teacher education program, their literacy education department, uh, they are required to take a reading across the content areas course. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I am one who teaches that course. And we have people taking that course that teach K through 5. We also have um, people taking that course that are involved in uh, middle grades education and uh, secondary education or MAT programs, which is a master's in arts in teaching. It's a five-year program we have. And what we try and do there is focus specifically on how reading can be a tool for learning. <clears throat> Pardon me. And... Uh, how we could also use, for instance, a lot of high-quality literature um, for read-alouds, for shared reading, uh, things of that sort, to build up sort of the necessary background knowledge that would allow a person like you, Marty, to um, get into a chemistry um, a textbook, which is quite difficult, but with a little bit more background knowledge than you would if it, you just sat down and opened it up and said, okay i got to make my way through it. Mm -hmm. So here at Kent State, we have um, made a um, concerted effort uh, to be explicit about the need for explicit reading instruction, K through 12, as well as uh, across the curriculum. And, and would you say this has been in um, uh, higher education for a, a, a while? Because I think Renee probably works with current teachers, and I'm wondering if she sees something different out there that some of the current teachers haven't had this course? As a, as a part of the um, a critical mission report that came out a few months ago, we surveyed all of the southern regional states and discovered that there are some states that require nothing like what Bill has described in order to get certification. And the one course that he has described is really the maximum that we've required for certification and it doesn't always get at. And Bill and I have worked together for a lot of years, and I'm going to be very complimentary of the course that he teaches. 
but many of our other pre-service teachers don't have that kind of experience. It's a very generic course and doesn't get to the point um, that we were talking about earlier about that content-specific literacy because historians do read differently than scientists read when we're reading those kinds of materials. And it's important for us to be able to offer those opportunities. So that's something that we have been pushing is that pre-service teachers need more assistance to understand how to teach these skills within the context of the content that they're teaching. That states need to provide additional certification hoops to jump through, for lack of a better a term to use there to ensure that teachers have those skills because it's difficult. It's it's not fair to require teachers to acquire that learning completely on their own without the support of their programs. Right. You know, and Marty, if I could interject just for a second on that point, what Bill mentions, and as Renee points out, is limited in certain states. However, that's a fairly recent phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So our emerging teaching workforce, if you will, in certain places are getting reading in the content area. But probably the vast majority of our incumbent teaching workforce, this is probably new information right. to them. So there's still a lot of people who are looking for uh, direction about how do we actually go about doing this. And I think the rest of our program today is going to address that <laughs> particular situation. <laughs> so I think it sounds like we better get to it. And who, Bill, do you want to continue talking well, about some of the strategies teachers can use on our next slide? Well, one of the things that the uh, uh, that has been a staple in reading instruction, no matter what grade level, and in fact, even before formal schooling, is um, the read aloud, and uh, that, of course, is is uh, been something parents um, have done for years and years, and elementary school teachers do this fairly routinely. Um, I'm thinking back to 20, 30 years ago when Jim Trelease wrote his book, The Read Aloud Handbook, and how popular that was. Uh, What happens in schools oftentimes is the read alouds by teachers tend to stop after elementary school. And yet we continue to have much research that a five to seven minute read aloud by a content area teacher in that content area is one of the most powerful demonstrations to students of what good readers do when they read. And in the case what uh, Renee was talking about, uh, mathematicians do read math text differently than I would read a novel or short story or even a picture book. So a mathematician who provides a demonstration to students of, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to demonstrate how a real mathematician reads a text, a math text. Watch how I do this. Mm. Is part of explicit reading instruction and is very powerful. Mm. And students never get a chance often to see how math teachers read math texts, how scientists read science texts. But it also sends a message that reading is important to those disciplines, that mathematics isn't just solving word problems. Um, Science isn't just doing experiments. Um, We have a long history of mathematicians and scientists using reading to understand their disciplines. And the read aloud uh, is still one possible way uh, to demonstrate good reading strategies, uh, good reading behaviors, good reading attitudes uh, to students. Uh, another strategy, quite frankly, is just um, student choices and personal selections. Uh, we've known for some time now that the degree to which you, a person is reading something that is of interest to them, that they're curious about, maybe even passionate about, uh, has a tremendous effect on uh, to what extent they comprehend the text. Conversely, if we're reading things that we, we're not interested in, we have a very difficult time uh, connecting. So this is one of these issues where, at least in the reading community, we call it a battle between a what's called a single-text mentality, which is 
sort of textbook-driven reading, and a multiple text reality uh, or rationality where, you know, we use multiple types of reading and genres and selections, and students get choices. Um, that has tremendous effects. Um, one of the effects it has is it uh, builds vocabulary. I'm often asked about, does vocabulary precede comprehension or does comprehension uh, produce good vocabulary? And I'm sort of <clears throat> convinced that, um, you know, the students that I've worked with that have wonderful vocabularies, one of the things they have in common is they read. Mm -hmm. So the more you read, um, the richer vocabulary you uh, you develop. Uh, and the last one is just build comprehension. Um, there's one thing that, uh, there's one goal that in reading instruction. It is uh, not necessary to read faster, read more fluent. Uh, it's to comprehend. And that, in turn, we hope, uh, will incre increase things like graduation rates. With that, I want to turn it back to the Renee on the um, the teachers. I'm sorry, the uh, schools. Which one? The schools. I beg your pardon. If teachers are going to do the things that Bill has outlined, then they have to have schools that support them in doing that. And that starts from the very highest level, that they have to have the right materials. We've got to have classroom environments and school environments in which reading is valued. There are a wide variety of materials. Bill talked about giving students choices and that those materials are easily accessible. Many of our students today undervalue the amount of reading they do because it doesn't come in a textbook form or it's not assigned reading. And so we have to value and help students learn how to read web-based materials, internet-based materials. We've got to support students in the kind of reality that exists in the 21st century and that doesn't always look like a traditional textbook. One of the things that we also need to be doing to support our teachers is to provide just-in-time professional development and that's the role of a literacy coach, someone who can help a teacher develop a lesson plan, who can stand side by side and demonstrate how to teach a strategy, who can support a teacher on an ongoing basis rather than the teacher simply having to go to a meeting and then come home and try to figure out what they're going to do. But schools also have to recognize those numbers that we talked about earlier, some of our students are reading at grade level, but if they don't get the right kind of instruction based on understanding their reading level, then those students won't continue to progress. Those at approximately, those students who are just slightly at risk, those tier two readers, need to have the right kind of support. And of course, those students who are struggling need to have the right kind of diagnostic assessment and the right kind of intensive support. If a student can't read, just sending them to, to multiple classes during the day and assuming that they're going to learn how to read on their own is a strategy that just simply does not work. And as Bill said, and uh, we have all said several times, the better readers read more and just not assigning reading, and homework is often, the best homework is simply reading. Not assigning that to struggling students is far too often the culture at schools that have lots of struggling students. The only students who are assigned summer reading or who are assigned reading in the evenings are those students who are already reading well rather than encouraging the students who are struggling to continue to read. We simply have to provide more opportunities in a school that is focused on a culture of literacy as well as explicit instruction so that students can do that. And many of those things connect back with the parents as well. Um, and so if I think that's where we're going to move next is to talk about the role of the parents in, in this. 
I've, I've got a question that came online here just now. If we could, this might be a good point for it. Uh, it says, if research tells us what techniques work best for comprehending textbook reading, why are we not writing our textbooks with these techniques in mind? Or are we now doing that? For example, uh, she says, start the section with a history of the topic to give some background, have stop and think sections in the text as we're reading, etc. Uh, I know this exists in some literature textbooks, but are we doing it in other texts? Uh, over to you guys. That's a question. Very, very often our, t- our newer mm-hmm. textbooks do have those kinds of supports. Um, but for a teacher who does not understand the importance of it, it's very easy to just skip over skip that right part over. Mm-hmm. and then just mm-hmm. assign students to read what's in the book and answer the questions at the end rather than do those things that make a difference. All right. I'd also agree uh, with Renee on that. And the other thing that I've noticed about some of the textbooks, um, many of them are um, including um, CDs um, in their video clips of content area teachers Mm -hmm. doing read-alouds, for instance, Mm -hmm. uh, in a science class or in a math class. And I just uh, have noticed from my students' reaction to these that they have been powerful for them. Mm -hmm. Um, Many of the teachers in these content area reading classes see themselves as strong mathematicians. That's why they majored in it. They like math. Mm -hmm. Reading is a foreign thing to them. They they didn't bargain into uh, teaching uh, how to read math. They're mathematicians, and yet when they see some of these textbooks of, that include video clips of teachers, it, um, it takes the, the, the mystery out of it. They, they see real teachers doing this kind of work in classrooms, and I think that has been a change in textbooks. Well, there's such wonderful technology out there to demonstrate these types of things. And, and to me, I mean, just in the school section, I know we have to move on, is if I was a principal of school, this this program is a wake-up call when I look at that 50%, 60% of students who uh, just need a different kind of environmental support to help them succeed. Uh, I think this is pretty powerful stuff you guys are sharing today and, and appreciate that. Um, I guess we're going to have to move on uh, to parents. I'll be happy to uh, add a little bit about that, uh, Marty. Uh, I think uh, Renee's comment about a culture of literacy uh, really uh, is a, a nice way to express this. And just as a school needs a culture of literacy, so does a home. And, uh, you know, there are many players and many different kinds of teachers. I like to think sometimes that we're all about teaching reading anymore. And parents are really the first reading teachers for their children. Um, and there's a, a lot that they can do at home uh, to support that, uh, just as we have schools with a literacy-rich kind of characteristic in the classroom. A home can have that as well role modeling uh, reading and talking with their students about reading. Uh, One statistic that we mentioned there on our slide is that children are only reading about four minutes a day in the fifth grade while they're watching as much as 130 minutes of television. Um, And parents can certainly have a role in uh, monitoring how much uh, television watching and video game watching and texting and blogging and and various other kinds of uh, activities students are engaged in and try to ramp up the amount of time that they're spending uh, with reading material. And again, if they're given choice as to what they read and material that interests them, they're more likely to do that. Also, monitoring their homework uh, can help. And one of the resource materials we have on the website is a a list of ways parents can uh, help their children improve their reading comprehension. So one of the things I encourage teachers to do is to take that list and at a parent-teacher conference, a share with the uh, parents and say, this is something we'd like you to do, too, because we're emphasizing this here at school. But the school's only part of the solution. The home is also mm-hmm. part of that. Absolutely. As is the student. And our, our next uh, slide points up uh, the importance of students increasing the amount of time that they spend in reading. Uh, as you can see, about 20% of high school students report no reading at all during a typical school week. Uh, so there's certainly some room for improvement there. Um, Less Again, less time watching television and more time reading. And even if it's graphic novels or comic books or magazines, um, those are reading uh, opportunities as well. It seems to me that, um, that a lot of our young people today are doing a lot more reading than they 
realize that they're reading because of the Internet. Um, and um, I know you mentioned that earlier, but uh, that question posed differently might find that students are reading there. So we, we do have that interest to, to kind of build upon, probably. I think it's sort of a way of rethinking the whole uh, situation and to acknowledge on the part of policymakers and schools and perhaps parents, too, and teachers, is that uh, reading is reading. If it's uh, a graphic novel, it's still reading. It uh, mm-hmm. doesn't all have to be Silas Marner to be uh, considered <laughs> Good uh, thing. useful. Good <laughs> thing. Although Happy I love that. Silas Marner very much. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have uh, one final uh uh, slide that uh, we selected a quote from a civil rights activist from the 1960s to uh, lift up the importance of change. And I think that's really what we're involved in in so many aspects of our workplace, our society, and our schooling, and everywhere today, the vast change that we're all dealing with. And uh, it's change about content teachers who perhaps think that's someone else's responsibility or parents who think it's the school's responsibility or students who are uninterested or any number of ways uh, that change has to occur from whatever perspectives. And as uh, King Whitney Jr. mentioned, to the fearful, change is threatening because it means things may get worse. Uh, To the hopeful, it's encouraging because things may get better. And to the confident, it is inspiring because the challenge exists to make things better. (laughs) It's our uh, thought that content teachers are part of that group that uh, are confident and will be inspired because there is a definite opportunity and challenge to make things better. Well, that's that's a, a terrific and a very positive way to end. And, and um, we're really um, sorry to end this conversation at this point. We're, we're limited to an hour today. We normally can go over. But um, as I said earlier, I thought we would probably only scratch the surface, and, and I think that is uh, the truth. There's so much more to be um, so many more questions and so many more things to um, to talk about. But we do have, um, we will have this archive for people to go back through. We've got wonderful resources for follow-up. Um, and maybe we need to have another uh, program and another discussion going a little more in-depth uh, on this on this topic at a later date. Marty. And, and I do want to add, um, for those of, of you listeners who like to travel, uh, we have a conference every February at Myrtle Beach, and our three guests are going to be providing a pre-conference workshop at America's At-Risk Youth National Forum, which you can find on our website. I think registration materials are going out, if not now, very soon. So February 14th, for three hours, you can spend with them to delve into this uh, more deeply and really take off. So we're excited to uh, let you know about that particular event. And we're um, looking forward to that as, as well. As very for much. Sure. Yeah, we get to meet y'all face to face. We'll have a ball. <laughs> I look forward. Well, to let's it. see. In, in the in the couple of minutes that we have left, um, if we can um, practice a little of what we preach. And um, the big six summarizing tops the list. Um, who would want to take a stab at um, two or three points that might? summarize uh, (laughs) what we've heard today, the important points. And, and, uh, Pat, I'll I'll go down to paraphrasing and uh, say something that I know you will say or list as one of your points, and that is it's a systemic problem, and I think the word you use is multifaceted, and I Mm -hmm. I would agree with that also. So certainly multifaceted problem requires multifaceted solutions. What other points uh, would you make that you would want people to remember and go back and study more about? There is something we can do. Good. I like we that. Do, we do have answers, and there are things we can do. It's not, despite the statistics, it's not a hopeless situation. And that's an important point. Very definitely. You know, the Disney World uh, folks are wonderful in their education and training programs with their employees. And one of the phrases that they use uh, when they talk about education and training and everyone contributing is they say, everyone has a role in the show. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to describe uh, Mm -hmm. this situation, too. Everybody's got a role in the show in addressing uh, this and being part of the solution. Even though you may not be necessarily part of the problem, you are part of the solution. Well, I want to thank you all, um, Pat O'Connor, Bill Benson, Renee Murray. Um, You've given us a lot to uh, think about, some great insights, um, food for thought, and um, 
we all need to go go back now and do a little more homework, a little more reading, and, and really become invested personally um, in this topic. I think it's that important. Well, I want to add my thanks. I've been had the pleasure of working with Pat, Bill, and Renee for over a year, and it's been more fun uh, doing the publication and now this broadcast, and we're all looking forward to the February uh, project at Myrtle Beach, and hope you'll all join us with that. But thank you, all three of you, for being with us today. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, This current webcast, as Sam has mentioned, will be available to listen to on our archived, and it's on our website, uh, www.dropoutprevention.org, actually right where you are if you're listening, and it'll be up in less than two hours. It is then uh, downloadable for your iPod or your MP3 players, and it's also available on iTunes, and you can subscribe to the Solutions uh, broadcast and get it every month to hear again and again and again. Uh, Next month, um, looking forward, uh, we have a wonderful program planned, as always, but this one is on November 10th at 3.30 Eastern Time, and our guest will feature Gail McGrain, who's the principal of the Central Learning Center in Forest Lake, Minnesota. Gail's expertise is in the area of building relationships with students, uh, with those students most at risk. And we all know how challenging this can be. And her approach is different. I highly recommend it. And actually, I'm working with Gail right now on her publication. So we've got um, a good program plan for them. So I look forward to seeing you on November 10th. Okay, and thanks to all of you for listening and participating. And I want you to remember we know why students are dropping out of school. And with research-based solutions, we can assure that all of our students graduate. Join us next time for more Solutions to the Dropout Crisis.